Hello, welcome to Literary Gladiators Channel. My name is Larry. Thank you for tuning into this video. It is my pleasure to have you, and I am going to be talking about Parker's Back by Flannery O'Connor. This is a story from her collection, Everything That Rises Must Converge, which is uh, her posthumously published collection of short stories. This is a great one. Uh, it's a really good story, and I'm going to be giving a discussion, analyzing what it's about. This is a story that is about primarily identity. Now, what is identity, right? Is it something that we get to pick for ourselves or is it something that is given to us by God? And of course, I'm going to be arguing, as I believe Flannery O'Connor is trying to make the point that it is the, uh, the, latter, or the latter, that it is something given to you by God. Uh, there are other people who would say that you get to decide who you are. And um, the main character in this story starts out as one of those people, as Parker. The story opens up, he's having a fight with his wife. Uh, Parker is fighting with her because of a fiction that he has uh, told her. He's lied to her about who his boss is. He's working for a woman. She's an old woman, but he's telling his wife that she is a young uh, blonde. And his wife is upset by this. Now, she is a uh, Protestant woman. She's a believer in God, but she has, you know, her own ideas about things that are not orthodox. She thinks that cars are sinful, for example. She thinks that churches are idolatrous. Pretty much everything to her is idolatrous. Tattoos are idolatrous. So that is, uh, that is her understanding of things. Parker, on the other hand, is someone who doesn't really see a lot of use for uh, moral thinking. And what he values is uh, self-expression and, and his own vision of himself. Right, and who, he, and who he's trying to convince everybody, including himself, that he is. Uh, you know, he wants to be the architect of his own uh, identity. He, he thinks that he's very attractive. He also has a lot of tattoos. That's primarily uh, where we see this theme of identity, is that he is covering up who he actually is, right, with all this ink. Um, when he was 14 years old, he saw a tattooed man at the circus and was inspired by this that he could uh you know do similar and in, in color and in, in kind of color himself uh the way that the man in the uh that he saw at the circus did so instantly as soon as he sees he starts getting tattoos uh his, and then he starts you know getting attention from the kind of girls that he likes to get attention from starts getting into fights and his mother comes concerned about this and takes him to uh, church revival and once he finds out that's where she's taking him he runs away from home instantly and joins the Navy then when he's in the Navy he continues to get more and more tattoos and as he's trying to uh, cover himself up and be something other than he is not he is in fact uh, dissatisfied right so he gets an idea for a tattoo he goes and gets that tattoo and after some time passes, he looks at himself in the mirror, and he doesn't like what he sees, so he goes and gets another tattoo. And this is a pattern that has been repeating itself till the point now where he's covered all over himself, except for his back, with tattoos. So he's, he's, but he doesn't, when he looks at himself in the mirror, he doesn't see the men, the tattooed men that he admired, you know, as a child, but he sees, uh, you know, a bunch of, you know, he describes it as being kind of you know, botched, right? The work, you know, it doesn't look, there's no consistency to anything. It's just all kind of like just thrown on there. So at any rate, at some point, you know, he becomes, he realizes that getting these tattoos is not uh, doing anything to, uh, to fulfill him. Uh, just so what does he do? He goes and he leaves the Navy. He just doesn't return to port one day. Then he uh, goes out to the country and he starts selling fruit. And that's where he, how he meets this woman 
who he would later marry. She's not like the women that he's usually with, and she does not like uh, his tattoos. He marries her, not in a church, because churches are idolatrous, according to his wife, Sarah Ruth. So, you know, what? A, and then another way, you know, other than covering himself up with tattoos, uh, another way that this that we're dealing with uh, his notion of a self-imposed identity is that he refuses to go by his given name, which is Obadiah. Uh, it's O-E, it's Obadiah Elihu. The name of Obadiah means servant of God. So we also find out uh, that O-E, as he calls himself, when he's out in, uh, in the open, okay, it depresses him because it makes him feel like somebody's after him. And who's after him in his mind? It's like the government or the navy or religion. Okay, now we find out that the only people who know his actual name is the government from his birth certificate, religion from his baptismal record, and the navy, where when he had to sign up for the navy, he had to give his, uh, his, his full name. So, again, we have that theme of identity. So what he's running from is himself, right? He's running from who he truly is and these institutions that know who he is, he does not want anything to do with them because he's trying to create his own version of himself. And the one thing that he does not want the world to think of him as is the one thing that he's constantly being revealed to be, which is a fool. It talks about at one point where he, his back does not have a tattoo because he does not want to have to get a mirror uh, and hold it behind him in order to look at the tattoo. He feels like that would be something that a fool would do. Then when he's showing his uh, his tattoos to his, his future wife, and when they meet for the first time, you know, he asks her which one she likes. She's like, I don't like any of them. He's like, well, you got to like one of them more than the others. So she looks and she says, well, that chicken's okay. He goes, that's not a chicken, that's an eagle. What kind of fool would get a, would get a chicken tattooed on them? She goes, well, what kind of fool would do any of it? So, you know, and then there is the fact that this woman that he works for is always kind of deriding him. At one point he takes off his shirt. She makes him put it back on because she's kind of disgusted by the tattoos. She's always talking about to him out of the side of her mouth, which is a way of saying, you know, that she's none too impressed with him at all. Thinks that uh, everything he touches, he breaks and all this kind of thing. So, OE uh, is not happy in his marriage and he can't figure out why he doesn't leave his pregnant wife because according to the rules that he lives by there would be nothing wrong with doing that right because there's nothing wrong with anything he's you know kind of got a he's morally ambiguous to say the least so he but he but for some reason he's hanging around now um he decides that he's gonna get a tattoo on his back uh because he wants to put something there that would uh, make his wife respect his, you know, his, his hobby of getting tattoos and, and admire it. So he starts trying to think of something that he could get that she would have to like. And he decides that something religious would be the way to go. So he thinks about getting a Bible. And then, uh, you know, he's not sure what he's going to do. Then he has this kind of... Uh, you know, coming to Jesus moment, so to speak, where he's out on a tractor working for the old woman. And there comes a moment where he's kind of blinded, uh, which is, you know, very reminiscent of St. Paul uh, in the book of Acts, when, you know, on the road to Damascus, when he's blinded uh, before he meets Jesus. And what happens is the tree comes, this old tree that she's got in the middle of her, of her yard, suddenly uh, reaches out, it says in the text, and grabs the tractor and throws him off the tractor and the tractor explodes. Oh, he's on the ground, not wearing any shoes. He looks at it, he looks in his shoes. He got thrown right out of his shoes and they're on fire. One of them's under the tractor, the other one's just lying in the field. So he uh, is struck by this moment. It's, it's more or less a religious experience for him he comes face to face with his own mortality and goes running he he goes into his truck jumps in drives off and doesn't stop until he gets to the city 
where his tattoo artist is and uh, he shows up his tattoo artist doesn't even recognize him because he's so transfigured by this event and you know this is another indication too right that his identity is not his to be chosen because if you'd figure if the tattoos and everything were the source of who this man was he'd be instantly identifiable but because of this religious experience that he's had it doesn't happen so he decides he wants to get god uh right and he comes to him that's what i need i need to get a tattoo of god on my back so uh the tattoo artist gives him a book of uh of jesus you know of all the different jesus images that he could get on himself now he's looking through the he, the, he tells him also that the more up-to-date versions of jesus are toward the back of the book so that's where he starts because you know he's <laughs> Probably by some instinct, he realizes, you know, that uh, that the more that that the uh, further away we get from the time of Christ, the more um, like the world the images of Christ that we create would be, and you know, so you know, he doesn't want to he doesn't want to conform to the ways of Christ, but he wants Christ to be more conformed to what he believes. So he starts at the end of the book. And he's going back, but nothing there is really satisfying. And it talks about some of the images that he sees in the back of the book. Uh, there's very non-threatening uh, images and um, reassuring is how the text describes him. And as he goes more toward the front, he gets less reassuring. And then as he's going, we'll take a look here at the Byzantine Jesus, right? This is the one that sticks out to him and it's the eyes especially as he's skipping through the book he sees those eyes looking at him and he doesn't like those eyes looking at him the way that they are it says in the text that uh the eyes are all demanding this is a byzantine uh icon of of christ here and this is right from the wikipedia page for this story this is what a lot of the scholars believe was the uh the image that would have been in that tattoo book of a Byzantine Jesus. So OE here is going through the uh, the book. He sees this one, he just keeps going. He's kind of scared by it, but then all of a sudden uh, there's this uh, voice that he feels in his head that says, go back. So he goes back to this one and he says, that's the one. So now OE gets, that, uh, gets this image of, of Jesus put on his back with the all demanding eyes. And the next thing that happens is he gets the tattoo done and he goes to this bar. One of the people there that knows him, you know, sees him and slaps him on the back. And he's, you know, he says, hey, I just got a new tattoo there. You know, don't slap me on the back. So, you know, of course, this uh, riles up everybody's curiosity, you know. So everybody in this bar knows him. They all gather around to see what new tattoo OE's got. So they pull up the back of his shirt and they take one look at it, and they just put the shirt right back down. They don't want it. <laughs> they don't. They don't want anything to do with it in this particular bar, right? This is not. Uh, this is not a group of uh, of religious people at all. So they <laughs> they throw it down, and then they start saying, "Hey, Oe, what happened? You get saved?" And he's like, "No, I didn't get saved. I don't. I didn't get religion. You know, I did this for my wife." And they're like, "No, you must have got saved. Who else would? Why else would you get a tattoo of Jesus if you haven't been saved?" Oh, he, he gets so furious that he starts to brawl in the bar and he starts punching and kicking and, 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 uh, and a couple of the bigger guys in the bar end up having, they pick him up and they throw him out. And it's a scene reminiscent of Jonah in the Bible where God calls him to go preach the word to a nation that Jonah does not like, right? So he does not want to go and do this. He, so he's trying to he goes in the opposite direction that God tells him to. He jumps on the ship and he's going. God sends a storm down to the ship and the ship is tossing and turning in the sea. And uh, it's getting ready to sink. And the men on the ship realize that it's because they have Jonah on the ship that, uh, that this is happening. So they throw him overboard. So now we've got OE out there on the, on the, on the, on the concrete outside the bar left to contemplate his soul and for the first time he's thinking about his soul he's thinking about the eyes of jesus 
uh, as they are there. And he wants to more or less uh, know what to do next, right? Because he's thinking about his soul and he's understanding that those eyes demand obedience. So he doesn't know what to do. So he decides he's going to go home and show Sarah Ruth. He's missing his wife real bad. So he wants to go back to her. And, uh, and for the first time, he wants to be oh, an obedient kind of a, a servant in a way, right? Because uh, obedience to a neighbor is good practice for obedience to God. So he goes back to her. And, uh, you know, of course, he hasn't been home in a couple of days. So she's got the couch wedged up against the door or whatever, some kind of furniture. Uh, it doesn't exactly say what, but he's not able to get into the house. So he's uh, banging on the door, saying, let me in, let me in. She's like, who is it? And he says, it's me, it's O.E. You know who it is. And she's like, O.E., I don't know any O.E., who is it? And what she wants is she wants him to give his real name. So he does. He says, it's Obadiah Elihu. And uh, it says, after he says that, like, the light from the rising sun behind him pierces through his soul and chases away all the spider webs and cobwebs that have, that have uh, been there, right? So it's kind of the presence of grace is entering him. He goes inside. She's yelling at him, you know, your boss was here, you lied to me, she's not some young blonde, and she's, uh, you're going to have to pay her for that tracker and all this and that, and, you know, yelling at him, and he goes and he turns on the, you know, the lantern, because he's going to show her this tattoo that he's got, that, you know, he thinks he's going to shut her up, and uh, he shows it to her, and she doesn't know who it is, he says, who is that? He says, what do you mean, who is that? That's God. She says, that ain't God. God's a spirit, you know, and then, uh, you know, he says, no, that's God. That's Jesus Christ. And she goes, that's idolatry, she says. She picks up a broom and starts beating him across the back with the broom. And uh, welts start coming up on the face of the tattooed Christ as Obadiah is enduring this, uh, this punishment. He's too shocked to do anything, it says in the book. So when she's done beating him, he goes outside and hangs on a tree and cries like a baby. Now, you know, this is a story about, uh, about identity and who Obadiah Elihu really is, is he's a child of God, right? We know from the story that he has been baptized. And then he has spent the time since his baptism uh, running away from, uh, from who he is and what he's called to do. He gets this tattoo on him, and in a way it's... Uh, it's a sacrament. It's kind of a, it's kind of a sacrament, um, in a way, right? It's not, it's not one of the seven sacraments instituted by Christ, but it is a sacramental kind of thing where it is an outward sign of, you know, of God's grace, you know? So that's what we, uh, that's kind of how we define sacraments in the church. And that's what, you know, this tattoo ends up being. Uh, at one point in the book, it talks about how, you know, he's got all these animals tattooed on him. And then once he gets these animals tattooed on him, he feels like the animals enter into him and, and, uh, and drive him this way and that, right? Because he's kind of always got that feeling of dissatisfaction and can't account for his own actions and all this. Well, you know, now he's got this tattoo of Jesus on him. And it's kind of infused into him as well, right? And now, now he's got something on him, real, something that that is uh, an outward expression of something that he can't even account for, right? He doesn't know why he did it. And when, uh, you know, we Christians, when we talk about our own salvation, it's something that we can't take credit for. We can't take account for it. It's not nothing that we did, right? Our, our own faith is a gift from God. We don't do anything to earn it. It is just infused to us by way of our, uh, of our baptism. And, you know, eventually in, and in the other sacraments as well, but initially with the baptism. So this is kind of a coming home to Jesus story for, uh, for Obadiah. And now he is uh, going to have to suffer, you know, and, and then, you know, at, at the end of the story where he's suffering, 
at the hands of Sarah Ruth. Penance takes on many forms, and suffering takes on many forms. But you know, for as long as we're suffering, you know, for the sake of Christ, then we're on the right path. So, you know, we see Obadiah kind of—he's very confused, he's very hurt, and he just doesn't understand what's happening to him. But yet we see this these, this transformation. We see now that he's thinking about his soul and he's thinking about things, you know, from a from a standpoint of what it means to be a child of God, even though it's not even explicit in him yet. We see this kind of transformation happening. Jesus is caught up to him in a sense, and he is responding positively toward that, even though it's and he doesn't really have anybody to help him out and to guide him on that on that path in his life you know because his own wife is very confused right like iconography this would be you know like a picture of jesus is not idolatry it's not it's uh, iconography it's uh meant to call us right it's meant to call us to uh to understand to see and to uh be inspired by things that are outside of ourselves, that are real and that are holy, such as Jesus Christ himself. So those are my thoughts on Parker's back. I'll be back in a couple weeks to talk about another story by Flannery O'Connor. I'll be talking about the enduring chill that will be in two weeks time. And, um, you know, I got two more lined up after that. So definitely uh, stick around, tune in next time. Thank you for watching this video all the way to the end. You guys are the best. I appreciate it. Please like this video if you like this video. Subscribe to this channel for more great content. And uh, stick around. We'll be seeing you. Thank you.